Good morning. We'll be starting um, in a minute. Thanks for those who have already joined us. Thank you. 
Marie, welcome. We don't hear you if you're trying to speak to us. You should unmute. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, perfect. We have had some, some technical difficulties. Is it okay like this? It's perfect. Ah, super. Hello, Olivier, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. <laughs> so I don't know if we can start or if we have to wait a little bit more. Or if everything is okay technically. People are usually more punctual on these webinars than they are at sessions. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Which is amazing. Uh, Maria, we are just missing one speaker, but I think we should start in the meantime, we'll try to get her. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you uh, everybody for being here. Um, I think it's a very important meeting that we have today on uh, Responsible Business Conduct Week uh, Working Group. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people participating, participating on our webinar and a lot of experts uh, with us. Um, as, you, as you know, the COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated how interconnected the global economy and global value chain are, but also are more resilient is needed um, and, and a lot of people that were not convinced about that before the COVID-19 uh, showed that uh, it is necessary to do something on this now. Um, so it is now important for the European Parliament to work on this. Uh, we know that there is an initiative coming from the European Commission, uh, but we have to have a very clear uh, point of view here at the European Parliament. Uh, we need also to have a level playing field in Europe and globally when it comes to uh, due diligence uh, also for uh, the European economy but for the global economy to have this uh, level playing field. Um, there is uh, a discussion for the moment uh, at the European Commission and under uh, the German presidency when it comes to mandatory due diligence legislation at the, U at the European level. But you also know that there is a discussion at the UN level for the UN treaty um, and, and we need to have a European position uh, on this. Uh, as you know, there is no position coming from the Europe, Europe at the UN uh, for this treaty. And Hopefully, um, uh, if we have this strategy for uh, due diligence at the European level, we can take this uh, strategy to, the go, to go to the UN uh, and have this uh, position. Uh, it is also important to have multi-stakeholder panel uh, today to discuss about that uh, and, and to exchange about uh, this uh, situation. Um, so we have um, uh, uh, different uh, stakeholder um, and, and to, mo to moderate uh, this, I will share uh, the floor with um, uh, Olivier de Suter uh, that I know very well uh, for working with him uh, here at the Belgium uh, level, but also at the UN, le uh, UN level. Uh, Olivier, you are law professor at uh, Université de Louvain and has recently been appointed as UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Um, uh, you are there to provide a keynote and, uh, on why the regulation on business conduct needs central objective for the agenda of the EU and the international community. Uh, so it will be very interesting to hear from you and from your experience uh, about uh, this situation. So I uh, directly give you the floor um, on this. For convening this uh, discussion on the role of the EU in promoting responsible supply chains. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence amongst us uh, of people whom I uh, respect and admire since many years, in particular Isabel Sherman from ETUC, 
Peter Rossman from the International Union of Food Workers, Carlos Lopez, my, my colleague from the International Commission of Jurists, and of course the three parliamentarians uh, that uh, shall join in the panel discussion. But thank you to Marie Arena for convening this. Marie was uh, very persistent in coming to Geneva to discuss these issues at UN level. And so her activity is Belgian, but it's also European and international. So as Maria Arena mentioned, we have entered a very interesting phase. The European Commission, Commissioner Didier Renders, has announced at the end of April that the European Commission would put forward a proposal for binding legislation um, on due diligence in supply chains to ensure human rights and environmental rights are complied with by EU-based companies. This follows a study presented in January 2020 on this topic by a consortium of researchers. And of course, it follows tenure of campaigning by NGOs, particularly by the European Coalition for Corporate Justice. The questions I'd like to address briefly in these introductory remarks are three. First, I'd like to ask, why should the EU actually adopt such a mandatory human rights due diligence legislation? Secondly, what should such a mandatory human rights due diligence legislation look like? And thirdly, I'd say a few words about how this shall influence the position of the EU in the UN negotiations on a new treaty on business and human rights. So first, why should the EU move in this direction? I'd like to put forward four reasons that it seems to me are key in convincing those who may still be skeptic about the need to move in this direction. First, We've seen in years many member states adopt such binding legislation, but it's been quite disorderly um, and not at all um, um, harmonized across the member states. The state of France has adopted on 27th of March 2017 um, a law on due diligence, which is extremely um, progressive and probably the most advanced example we have. In the Netherlands, um, the child labor due diligence law was adopted in 2019. In the UK, we have the Modern Slavery Act that was adopted already in 2015. And all these developments create in the EU a risk of distortions in the internal market and of unfair competition as the member states move at different speeds. And we should also realize, and that's a second reason why we may need harmonization at this level at um, at EU level, that for transnational corporations operating across the EU, they now face different legal regimes depending on where they are present. And although partial harmonization has been achieved by the non-financial reporting directive, directive 2014-95, this remains very minimal, this harmonization we have until now. Um, Otherwise, businesses must basically adapt to 27 different um, jurisdictions when having activities across, across the EU. And each of the EU member states today have different expectations as to whether or not businesses should control their subsidiaries and should control their suppliers and business partners in global supply chains. So I think for the, for the sake of the internal market itself and to avoid... Um, distortions and fragmentation in the internal market, it's important that we make progress in this direction. Thirdly, um, we should realize that even in the absence of legislation in a number of member states, courts are making progress in clarifying the duty of care that is imposed on businesses when a violation of human rights occurs in the supply chain on the basis of uh, the Brussels One regulation, a regulation 2015 slash 2012 and on the basis of general civil liability laws and the duty of care that can be imposed um, on this basis. If we consider, for example, how in the UK courts have been debating cases such as Okpapi or Vedanta resources, there's a great uncertainty for businesses who do not know basically what um, type of compliance is expected from them and who must adopt to, to who must adapt to, to changing expectations of court. So I think it's in the interest of businesses themselves uh, to have greater legal certainty in this area. Um, we should also um, uh, realize that um, 
a harmonized approach to um, due diligence obligations across the EU is a way to protect the EU brand of doing business. In other terms, it's a way to ensure that the reputation of companies based in the EU shall be preserved wherever these companies operate. And I think it's in, extremely important in the current context where uh, these companies are competing at global level to have this protection um, um, ensured, um, uh, ensuring that um, when other partners or countries deal with EU-based companies, they know that these companies will behave according to certain binding standards. Um, finally, and most importantly, this legislation shall reduce what we could call the risk of social and environmental rights leakage. In other terms, the vicious cycle in which companies outsource activities to jurisdictions where wages are low, labor legislation weak, union activity discouraged, and where environmental standards are lax or under-enforced. In turn, this leads the countries to be tempted to lower social and environmental standards in order to attract investment, in order to seek to achieve competitive advantage in the global markets by maintaining workers in poverty and by tolerating an extractive use of natural resources. And so um, I think it is this vicious cycle we, we must escape by imposing on, on businesses this common standard of conduct in the areas of human rights and environmental rights. In the future, our message should be that companies doing business in the EU should encourage their subsidiaries, suppliers um, to comply with human rights and environmental rights, and that this shall be a strong incentive for countries to opt for a sustainable form of development. And this is not protectionism. On the contrary, it is the opposite. It is um, expressing our solidarity vis-a-vis -vis NGOs, unions, social movements in the Global South by imposing strong obligations on companies seeking to take advantage of the opportunities of the internal market and, and using the, the, the huge power that 450 million consumers in the EU have. The EU is 21% of the global GDP to send a message across the world that countries shall be rewarded if they move to sustainable development rather than lower environmental and human rights standards in order to attract investors. So there are a number of reasons why this legislation shall be extremely important. My second question, and more briefly, um, will be um, what should such a mandatory human rights due diligence legislation look like? And I'd like here to refer to a, a study I was commissioned to write by the International Trade Unions Confederation on this exact topic of how should we uh, think about human rights due diligence binding legislation, in which um, we emphasize that there should be two separate but complementary obligations um, in a regime addressed to companies. First, we need to indeed establish a human rights due diligence obligation, a duty to prevent the risk of human rights violations occurring within supply chains or within the corporate group. But secondly, apart from that due diligence that companies are expected to perform, we need to ensure that they will be civilly liable, responsible, if indeed human rights violations or environmental rights violations occur within their sphere of influence. And it's important that these two obligations, the preventive and the remedial, are treated as separate and complementary. Um, in other terms, even if a company does everything it must do to conform itself to human rights due diligence obligations, even if these human rights due diligence obligations are, are monitored and have been fully complied with, this should not result in a guarantee of legal imp immunity from civil liability claims, where it appears that despite the preventative measures having been adopted, um, the company has failed from preventing the harm from occurring. If the victim has proven that a, a harm has been inflicted and that this harm is in connection with the activities of a company, it should be for the company to rebut the presumption that it could have done more to prevent the occurrence of the harm. And if we don't treat these two obligations as separate, there's a big risk that the human rights due diligence, due diligence process 
may become a box ticking exercise in which a company will seek to comply with the minimum requirements um, that are imposed in order to comply with the human rights due diligence legislation. Um, it will seek information, it will prevent uh, violations to some extent, but it will not be incentivized to permanently improve and to adapt a hands-on approach on how suppliers behave, on how subsidiaries behave in order to avoid civil liability. And so it's important um, in other terms um, that even though we impose human rights due diligence obligations on companies, this is not a sort of shield from liability, from civil liability claims if those preventive measures are not sufficient. And I'm sure my, my colleagues, particularly Peter Rossman and Carlos Lopez, can elaborate further on this point. Thirdly and finally to conclude, um, how shall this development influence the position of the EU in the United Nations negotiations on a new treaty on business and human rights? Well, as Maria Arena has rightly emphasized, the EU has been very um, concerned about these, this negotiation. It has not engaged constructively in the discussion and um, it has uh, set a number of red lines at the start of the negotiations that have really not been um, well received, quite frankly, by our negotiation partners. Our, I believe, however, that the EU should now, um, as it develops this legislation, engage more constructively in this process for, um, I would suggest, four reasons. First, in order to improve legal certainty for business, and I, I, I already mentioned this point, I think companies today are concerned that they do not know exactly what rules they should comply with, and it's important that at global level too, this certainty is provided. Um, secondly, it is a duty of the EU under international human rights law to move um, in this direction and to contribute to um, global governance being um, improved in this respect. As we know, human rights treaty bodies, such as, for example, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, in its general comment number 24, adopted in 2017, have been very explicit about um, the duty of companies uh, to comply with human rights and to prevent um, human rights violations in global supply chains. And the treaty is simply a means to ensure that these already existing human rights obligations are effectively, more effectively complied with by businesses and states alike. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, as the EU moves towards adopting human rights due diligence legislation, it has an interest in establishing a level playing field, ensuring that all corporate actors from wherever they operate, in other terms, wherever these companies are domiciled, comply with the same standards, are bound by the same kind of requirements and express the same expectations vis-a-vis -vis their suppliers, thereby sending the message to the states that it is in their interest to better protect human rights and environmental rights, because that is the way to keep investors confident that the reputation will not suffer from doing business in the country. So this is why we need a global framework. It's in order to create this um, virtuous circle in which all states will be encouraged to improve the standards in order to reassure investors that they're complying with these um, global norms once they are adopted. Fourth and finally, and I close with this, we today have very large movements, NGOs, social movements that are challenging globalization, not because they're against trade or against foreign investors, it's because they fear that globalization is not sufficiently monitored and that um, um, politics um, and states are behind the developments of technology and businesses. And we need to basically react to this backlash against globalization by demonstrating that globalization may result not in a pressure to lower standards, but instead in a pressure to improve standards, provided the international legal framework rewards fair business conduct and rewards jurisdictions that comply with their international obligations rather than encouraging social and environmental dumping. So these are the few remarks I wanted to present to open our discussion. I'd like to thank you again for welcoming me, welcoming me at, the, at the European Parliament. Uh, thank you, Maria Arena, for arranging this and thank you to 
um, to Magbule Sahan from the International Trade Unions Confederation for facilitating this dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you, for your um, remarks that really set the frame for our the discussion of our panel. Um, let me just introduce myself quickly. I'm Mark Fulisan. I'm the legal director of um, the ITUC, and I'll be taking you through our panel today, where we would like to um, speak about the benefits of um, responsible business conduct and due diligence for both workers and businesses, and then come uh, have a discussion about the regulatory options at the um, international level and the European level. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce the panel we have today. We have Marcella Manubens from Unilever. She is the Global Vice President of Integrated Social Responsibility. We're still trying to join us from New York, um, but we hope we are. We have Peter Rossman from the International Union of Food Workers, and uh, Isabel Sherman, who is also co-host of this uh, webinar from the uh, who's ETUC Secretary, Secretary as well as other speakers from the International Committee. Uh, turn to start with by turning to Peter, but before that, uh, I would also like to um, remind everybody. I see there are a lot of comments and the. Uh, in the chat function, but please feel free to also um, write questions. We will try to come back to those at the very end. So uh, let me turn to uh, Peter Rossman. Uh, Peter, you, you work for the International um, Union of Food Workers. You've been representing workers in agriculture, um, food and the hotel industry with companies. And I'd like to ask you, what difference do you think effective due diligence um, can make for workers? And uh, what are the prerequisites to achieve respect for human rights through hum human rights due diligence at the workplace level? Hello. Hello. Are we working now? Can you hear me? Good. Okay. So, well, the the IUF has now had a a decade of productive engagement with Unilever, and and we of course believe that this process has brought very tangible gains for our members' ability to access and to exercise their rights. I think it's appropriate that uh, Marcella speak about what this has meant for the company. But I, I think it's very important to note that what we do with Unilever and what we do with the other companies in our sectors who've moved down this path, this is only possible because we have an agreed framework for negotiation, which is based on recognition of the IUF and the rights of our members. And that means that freedom of association, not in the abstract, but in practice, is fundamental to everything we do. Now, I, I think we would all agree that the, 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 the urgent need to ensure respect for human rights and supply chains, I mean, this discussion has been fueled by massive and well-publicized catastrophes like Rana Plaza. Unfortunately, that's what it took. The problem was always there. It's only come to light. But it's important to bear in mind the full scope of due diligence because the focus on supply chains sometimes allows violations of rights inside companies' own operations to fall from view. Most of the IUF's work with Unilever, it's been about ensuring respect for workers' rights in Unilever factories, in countries as diverse as India, Pakistan, Russia, and the United States. And one of the most important things we've done together with Unilever is, in my view, an agreement on sustainable employment and manufacturing, whose starting point is mutual recognition of the many human rights risks which can arise 
from the use of non-permanent employment contracts and which provides for a permanent process of monitoring those risks and negotiating solutions. We have worked on rights violations in the supply chain, and that's also brought positive results, but we're able to do this because our role is acknowledged and recognized and given expression in agreements we've signed. Joint work on supply chains is only possible. It's only possible because as Unilever and the other companies with whom we do this have come to recognize audits and certification have failed. That's a box ticking exercise that Olivier described. And so direct engagement with unions is a precondition for meaningful due diligence in their own operations, but in their supply chains as well. No audit, no certification can hope to capture the reality of rights at the workplace. As McBoole said, we represent, amongst other sectors, workers in agriculture, and the IUF routinely finds egregious human rights violations on farms, on plantations that have been certified as socially sustainable. In fact, they're marketed on that basis. So if due diligence is to be more than a public relations operation or a box ticking exercise, it has to be built. It can only work on a foundation that gives trade unions and trade union rights a central role in the process or the only group to benefit will be the audit and certification industry, which has failed spectacularly. Remember, Rana Plaza was certified. So privatizing due diligence does not and it cannot work. Even after a decade of engagement with Unilever, I think it's fair to say that it's a work in progress. And we have to take stock of the basic fact that Unilever and the small number of other companies who've taken meaningful steps in recognition of their human rights obligations are outliers. And this outlier status in a highly competitive environment, in an environment of legal uncertainty, as Olivier described, is their, their, their outlier status means that the entire process is fragile. And I think it would be absurd to imagine that a that, that, that a process on this scale can be solved on a company by company basis when the problem is global. It has to be anchored in a comprehensive legal framework, which is mandatory, which provides for sanctions, and which applies to all businesses. So I'm very conscious of the time, but in this context, I'd like to make a related point, and that will be my final point, which is human rights are concrete, Yet we often tend to speak of business almost as an abstraction. And the reality is that we work and we live in a hyper-financialized global system in which not just financial actors, but service and manufacturing companies are competing to deliver the highest rates of return in the shortest possible time to their investors. They're competing in financial markets. They're not merely competing for market share. And this means that restructuring is, perm is, is permanent. The constant shuffling of operations of suppliers is, 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 a, is a daily process, and that process is accelerating. So due diligence must be a permanent process and not something that can be dispatched with an audit. A tidal wave of mergers and acquisitions, a process that is even accelerating under the impact of, of, of the COVID pandemic, means that, that, that corporate ownership has become a very fleeting phenomenon. It's constantly in motion, it's a moving target. Today's CEO, today's Director of Human Resources is gone tomorrow, along with the workplaces that yesterday employed thousands of people. The world's second largest private employer is in fact a private equity fund whose business model is built on the rapid turnover of their portfolio companies. And at the same time, some of the largest global corporations generate their income streams and their profits from rents based on intellectual property and from franchising and licensing arrangements, which allow them to escape their employer and their other responsibilities, including, of course, their fiscal responsibilities. So the entire structure is built on plausible deni deniability. And it's in this situation that workers are seen as an encumbrance, a liability rather than an asset, 
and ensuring respect for workers worker rights therefore falls to the bottom of the list of corporate priorities and this financial dynamic is unfolding against a significant rise in authoritarianism in violence in political and social violence we face a global human rights emergency and we have to state very clearly that volunteerism has failed and the many many victims of human rights abuses around the world including corporate abuses are still looking for something called access to remedy so for all these reasons and of course for many more we strongly endorse uh, uh, the presentation of uh, Professor de Schutter, and we strongly support the call from our European regional organization, the FIUF and the ETUC for legislation which would make human rights due diligence comprehensive and mandatory at the European and of course at the global level. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And you've spoken about the collaboration we, you have with Unilever. We have Marcella from Unilever on this call. We're facing a few technical challenges at this stage, but we hope we can come back to her later. So at this stage, I would like to turn to um, my colleague Isabel from the ETUC. Isabel, um, Peter has spoken about the importance of legislation in order to achieve uh, change across the board. Many unions are working with companies and have achieved good results, but in order to achieve real change, we need, uh, we need a legislation that applies to all companies. And the ETUC has joined many civil society organizations in Europe um, calling for such legislation. Can you, can you um, talk to us about what, you are, your, what type of directive you are seeking? Well, thank you, Mike Bley, and thank you, Maya. I think this is, uh, we'd like, first of all, to uh, to congratulate uh, uh, the whole participants who have an interest in, in joining this discussion. I think it's a very important one. It's a topical but also a timely discussion. And I think this is where we want to influence indeed uh, not just the EU agenda but also the international agenda. And I think this is, uh, this is very much appreciated that, that, that so many people are taking uh, this, this uh, issue um, uh, as it should be. Indeed, and I think uh, we need to have an inclusive approach, and I think this is also the purpose of these discussions. The second point is, is of course, that what we see is that uh, the trade unions and the workers are also legitimate and key players in these discussions, uh, not alone because of the existing European uh, framework supporting information and consultation rights of workers, but also their participation, active participation involvement in any um, decision-making processes at the business level, in particular when it impacts employment, uh, when it impacts the working conditions and the working environment, and it's exactly where human rights are uh, located. And I think here, one of the prerequisites we have heard uh, and we see for the uh, future European legislation is in the disrecognition that trade unions workers are the legitimate players to shape uh, a sustainable due diligence. That's one point. And I think the content uh, of, the, of this legislation uh, at the European level should be ambitious. It should be ambitious in terms of um, the scope. We have spoken of, of a very large scope in terms of uh, covering all businesses, covering also all human rights. I think it is not okay to have a kind of cherry picking exercise from businesses to take certain human rights on board and to avoid others and especially when it's not really appealing to i would say a large a crowd of of consumers and i think here the responsibility lies also in the legislation to be able to secure that and that would uh, allow to have what the previous two speakers have mentioned to have a sound and robust um, level playing field for all and especially for businesses in terms of legal certainty and legal predictability, but also bring uh, this famous AU grant, uh, which should be actually the driver for upwards conversions when it comes to workers and human rights uh, at, the, uh, at the end. The second point is, of course, we need to have um, effective remedies. And I think this is something which is clearly linked to the access to justice. And I think here we have to have a legal framework which is uh, very ambitious on those two elements and especially 
to move the burden of proof not uh, on on the victims but on the businesses and i think this is something which is key and what what does a legislation without effective enforcement and compliance and i think here we have to be clear that such a directive uh, or regulation should involve mechanisms to guarantee uh, an effective compliance uh, and also the enforcement of such uh, measures so the lie the responsibility lies by member states but also by the businesses and i think all of us uh, are on board to um, to allow uh, and and to push for such a uh, ambitious framework i think at the end of the day what is expected is uh, that there are mechanisms in place uh, which uh, lead to, to a no tolerance to um, human rights violation. I think this is key and it should be the case in Europe, but also in case in worldwide. Uh, and this is the reasons why we're joining forces today so that one exercise can influence the other one and reciprocally. Um, and I think here one uh, element which is key is that the trade unions and the workers are part of the solution, not of the problem. And I think this is something which has to be clear for all actors. And I'm looking forward to discussions and the questions. We've received some questions, so please continue to ask your, your questions through the chat. As I said, we'll come back to that later. We have connected Marcella, but we're still having issues with the audio. So I'd like to um, turn to um, Carlos from the International Commission of Jurists at this stage. Um, Carlos, we talked about why uh, mandatory due diligence is so critical at the European level for business workers, but also more broadly for society and the planet. But clearly, there are not only European companies that are engaged on the on the global market. And in fact, European companies may end up competing with companies in weaker regulatory frameworks. Um, so what do you think, uh, what opportunities exist at the international level to achieve the same um, coherent type of uh, legislation through the UN treaty and other processes? And what difference do you think um, the EU's engagement in the negotiations uh, would make as somebody who has followed the negotiations and advised on them closely since the beginning. Hello, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Pule, for the for the introduction and uh, I thank very much again the organizers for inviting me to speak in this important webinar. It's uh, always an honor and a privilege to be among you today. Um, well, I had the benefit of uh, um, having uh, Olivier the shooter going first because I think he has already put on the on the on the on the table all the arguments that are needed for the debate today, and I very much agree with his approach and uh, all his conclusions. Uh, but uh, at the risk of repetition, let me address the questions that you have posed to, to me, Imad Um What is with a question that mandatory due diligence at the European level is uh, critical for businesses and, and workers, as well as society and the planet. But clearly there are uh, not only European companies on the global market, and there are not only European workers or, or workers of European companies or, or communities around the, the world. Uh, um, indeed, uh, the process of economic globalization of the last uh, three decades or so uh, has meant an equal global presence of uh, companies from the United States, uh, China, Canada, and other emerging economies such as Brazil, India, Malaysia, and others. So, in some regions of the world, uh, such as uh, Latin America, foreign investment comes in equal parts from the, the EU countries, uh, the United States, and, and China. A third foreign you know. So, uh, change in only one 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 part of any third of, the, of that equation is, is not going to make a big or, 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 uh, impact on the situation on the ground. European companies may be competing in these circumstances with companies in countries with different or weaker regulatory frameworks, as has been explained already. Some countries have already adopted legislation in relation to uh, due diligence, for instance, uh, 
And this would put them uh, at certain disadvantage in relation to companies that operate in other regulatory frameworks. Uh, more crucially, uh, for those like uh, me who work for human rights and, and, and labor rights, is the fact that, the, and there are many people, workers or members of, of local communities whose uh, lives and well being are intrinsically linked to the operations of companies that are not European. These workers, these people in these communities deserve equal level of protection of their rights and, uh, and equal opportunities uh, for a life out of poverty. Um, we should not forget, as uh, Martin Luther King, uh, King put it uh, some time ago in 1968, injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Or as the Philadelphia Declaration, now part of the Constitution of the ILO, the International Labor Organization, already put it in 1919, uh, poverty anywhere constitutes a danger to prosperity everywhere. So we should tackle those phenomena, those problems equally across the world. There is one process within the United Nations that offers uh, right now the prospect of concrete steps uh, towards that level playing field that is so important for businesses and workers alike. That is the process towards an international legally binding instrument on business and, and human rights, as has been mentioned already. And there is an inter this is an intergovernmental process uh, open to all states, members of the United Nations. Around 90 states participate in the meetings every year. This is already the sixth year uh, of the process, uh, and, and we continue moving ahead. And the European Union and EU member states have regrettably taken a back seat uh, so far. They have been in the room, uh, but not taking very active and driving seat there. There is a revised draft of the instrument under discussion. Now, the draft contains uh, several elements relating to responsible business conduct including mandatory human rights due diligence and will probably contain even more in the future and these provisions are consistent with existing obligations as Olivier put it. Article 5 of the current revised draft already contains obligations for states to adopt measures to ensure businesses implement human rights due diligence in accordance with well-known parameters as those contained in the guiding principles on business and human rights and other instruments. These provisions are assorted with national procedures to ensure compliance and eventually apply sanctions to those companies that do not comply. Article 6, the next article, also contains provisions on civil and criminal legal responsibility of business enterprises, including transnational enterprises. One of those provisions relates to civil responsibility for the failure of parent or controlling companies to take measures to prevent their subsidiaries and suppliers from causing harm to human rights. These provisions uh, will be definitely improved uh, even more in, in the next rounds of discussions, but we need engagement in the, uh, uh, in the stage where we are from the EU states and, and businesses alike in this effort by addressing the substance of the proposed draft, proposed drafts and, and seeking to build consensus. I'm conscious of the time, but uh, I still have one thing to say. There is also an incipient uh, but relatively long-running process within the International Labor Organization in which uh, uh, technical working parties uh, with tripartite representation have been discussing the need for a new instrument to improve protection of decent work and workers' rights in global supply chains in particular. A resolution and plan of action approved in the International Labor Conference of 2000 16 set the path uh, forward in this regard, but it needs to be implemented. Yeah, um, ILO action is necessary because uh, uh, it is, uh, they have a, a huge experience, they have a tripartite structure, and also has a, and its own mandate to promote this and work in the world. Regrettably, here, although many states, including EU states, uh, seem to be open to the idea now uh, in the ILO, uh, it is business representatives that are dragging their feet here. So we certainly need a more univocal, uh, unequivocal, sorry, and a stronger message from EU countries also to these businesses. Uh, definitely the, the participation uh, will make a, a very important impact, uh, you know, and is necessary and critical to the success of these initiatives at the, uh, at the global level.
Um, today, last than at any time in history, EU states can adopt uh, a unilateral or isolationist uh, paths progress. We cannot build prosperity and human rights only in one region. EU active participation and leadership in the international negotiations uh, will undoubtedly uh, create renewed uh, processes within the Human Rights Council and the ILO. Not only is the EU the biggest player in the global market play, play, marketplace, as, as Olivier said already, but also its influence is uh, over all the countries and groups of countries can have a positive impact and, and knockdown effect. Uh, so um, they declare EU commitment to human rights in the world, human rights defenders, and multilateralism need to materialize in concrete deeds. That's what I have to say as a final message. So we need, and we look forward to, to seeing this in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the global multilateral forum. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus, um, for your comments. And um, I think at this stage, then I would like to hand it back to um, to Maria to see if we can um, have some of the commentators up. Maria? I can see you, but I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, it is okay? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, all for your uh, presentation, Olivier, Peter, Isabel, and Carlos. Um, and it, it, it will be very difficult to make a conclusion of that on what you have said, but I think there are very strong ideas that you put uh, here on this uh, webinar. The first is, of course, there is a strong EU and international need for regulatory framework um, to prevent, but also to give access to remedies and justice for victims. Um, you have said that voluntarism has failed, uh, so we must have uh, human rights comprehensive and mandatory for all. Um, and also to take into account the finance sector, uh, because uh, they are really big players in the economy, and it is important to have this included in uh, these comprehensive uh, frameworks. Um, also, workers and trade unions are important players. They are part of the solution. They are not part of the problem. So it is really needed to have these important stakeholders with us when it comes to build this uh, regulatory framework uh, at the European level, but also uh, at the international le uh, uh, level. And you said it, uh, Carlos, when it comes to ILO and the multilateralism is so important when a lot of people are critic about multilateralism, EU has to take its role on this uh, multilateralism. And also that there is no tolerance for human rights violation wherever they are. Uh, it is not only the question of the EU uh, region, but it is the question of the global value chain. And as the global value chain concerns all part of the world, we need to be very focused on all part of this of the world. And so the UN treaty, uh, but also all the different instruments that we have at uh, the global level uh, has to be uh, activated uh, for this due diligence uh, responsibility. So I think it's really important all these messages that you gave, because uh, as you know, uh, the Commission is uh, working now on this, and we also have to be very clear on the next presidency of the Council. Uh, it is Germany, and Germany has a very big role uh, on the global value chain uh, and, and a very big interest for industries uh, to have this European brand and to uh, work on this due diligence. Um, I have now uh, the pleasure to give the floor to different MEPs working on this due diligence and business European uh, conduct uh, group. I will give the floor 
first to Lara Volters. She's a rapporteur on jury uh, on this corporate due diligence report. So, Lara, you have the floor now at the first uh, uh, MEP, and after I will give the floor to A.D. Otala. So, Lara, you have the floor. Very much. Is this no camera? Unfortunately, let's see if we can turn that around. Video front. Here we go. Better. Yes. Okay. Apologies. Every time uh, we do this, there's a there's a new system to be used and. Uh, and it's not not always easy to figure out how each one works. But but thank you so much. Uh, thank you for organiz uh, organizing this, Marie, and thank you to to all the the, the speakers. Um, I have found this extremely uh, extremely interesting. Um, not in the least because I think that uh, every time I listen to these things, there's new elements to the narrative that are very very useful for the political discourse on this. Um, so, for instance, what Mr. Deschutter said on that this is a way to protect the EU brand, in a sense, you know, the, the EU brand for, for EU companies uh, in the world, um, or that, um, you know, we shouldn't think in terms of protectionism when we defend why this needs to be done, but we need to make the narrative of, of no, this is, um, this is about, uh, about solidarity, um, and this is about using the leverage of the EU internal market to do that, and we'd be we'd be silly uh, not to, in a way. Um, and following on from some of the speakers, because I think a lot has been said, and there's no no use in me trying to either summarize or uh, or just to, to repeat. But a couple of the questions I have that I'd like speakers' um, thoughts on are: um, I think that uh, one of the difficult things here will be making a um, making sure that we, we we capture all the companies that we want to capture um, without being um, without being too too general. And I just wonder if I could get speakers ideas on how we can make sure that we make obligations proportional to the size of the company, for instance, to its risk profile, um, but also to you know the potential nature of their adverse, impact and the way that th this is playing out at the moment is that different countries are introducing different thresholds um, are using different systems um, but I think that for me making making sure that um, that we, we we get this right in terms of you know not being overly granular that we so that we don't capture some um, but not being um, not being too general either so that we miss certain companies that's that's a challenge because of course it is up to every company to, to engage in this active process of due diligence but at the end of the day it's the company itself that knows its field best that knows its suppliers best uh, that and that knows its potential risks best uh, so that's one question i had another question i had um following on from this using the the leverage of the of, uh, of our internal market um how can we best use that argumentation of protecting the EU brand with the business community? Because what has struck me is that when you read reports about this, for instance, that in the parliament or, or that the commission has made, it seems that individual businesses say that they're supportive of this process, that they're actually very much in favor of it due to this level playing field argument, but that when they unite themselves or when they, when they, um, when they form business alliances, that it's not always the case. And I'm thinking of Business Europe, for instance. Um, so how can we make sure that that, that narrative of, of you know, the, the, the protecting the EU brand and how important that is, that it also resonates not only with individual businesses, but with the business community as a whole. So when they're uniting them, themselves in, um, uh, in industry associations, for instance. Um, especially, of course, given also what one of the speakers said, that sometimes this is not... Um, you know, this is not businesses that are very easily traceable because we're also talking about private equity funds. We're talking about shareholders sometimes. We're talking about, you know, a silent group. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there because I'm conscious not to take up too much, uh, too much time. Uh, thank you again for organizing this. <laughs>
So, yeah, I think you can hear me. Okay, so I give the floor to Heidi Otala, Chair of the Responsible Business Contact uh, Working Group. Heidi, uh, if you can hear me, you have the floor. Heidi? On n'a pas ID. Moi, j'entends rien. Hello, ID. Hear me now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we you. see you and you can yes. hear you. Thank you. I share a lot of agony about this, uh, to me, very new application. But anyway, so Marie, thank you so much for convening this because you will be in an absolute key position of important elements of, uh, of this um, um, exercise that we are now treading on um, as chair of the subcommittee on human rights. And um, uh, I think um, in the parliament, we are now building a very important and exciting uh, coalition of rapporteurs, shadow rapporteurs across from uh, at least four or five committees. So I, I haven't seen anything like this before. It's a, it's, it's a great pleasure. And it seems that, uh, that we are really um, networked uh, with uh, researchers, with labor, labor unions, with NGOs from the environmental human rights scene, with progressive companies, so um, we have to make sure that we succeed. Um, and really, we see that due diligence is the talk of the town, because I, I just counted that even in just my calendar, there are five events related to this uh, exercise this week only, including yours. And the next one will be uh, the hearing in the DRUA and uh, jury committees this afternoon. So please, if you have a possibility to follow, then, then do, because then we are going to, to discuss uh, the role of, uh, of these two committees, the two rapporteurs, Lara Walters and uh, Raphael Glucksmann. So, um, and also, I think uh, we are at a, a juncture where we have to understand the lessons from the French law, and that's what we are exactly doing. We'll have uh, Dominique Potier, the, the key MP, from the French National Assembly with us in one of the events this week. And um, um, more excitingly also, we are now already uh, able to, to see the first draft report, which has been produced by Delara Burkhardt for the Environment Committee on the so-called forest risk products. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we have a possibility to discuss how much we should now focus on horizontal uh, due diligence legislation on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence, and how much we should combine that with, for instance, sectoral guidelines. So that will be an opportunity to, to do that exercise. On financial markets, as, we, as it was pointed out, I think we have a challenge here because the EU taxonomy on sustainable mm -hmm. finance uh, took a very, in my view, quite a primitive <laughs> Uh, starting point, which was that let's do with climate and environment first, and let's let's look at the other dimensions later. And I wonder if we really want to emphasize the role of trade unions, labor unions, the the human rights of uh, of workers all around the world in this exercise. How are we going to fit that with the, the emerging le legislation on taxonomy on the sustainable finance? And that would be my question to to Olivier de Schutter. Also, I think um, Olivier de Schutter made very important uh, remarks about um, the connection of due diligence legislation with FTAs, free trade agreements. And I'd like to have your advice on how we should make that link, uh, how we should make this sort of cross-reference between the two instruments. Because it seems to me that indeed what you say is really true. We have to invite other countries to introduce sustainable development and what we have here is the force of 450 million EU consumers. So indeed, um, let's uh, try to solve these issues so that we can inspire the Commission to come up with the, the best possible legislation beginning of next year. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Thank you. I give the floor to Raphael Glucksmann, uh, rapporteur in droit uh, on the jury report. Um, so, Raphael, if you hear me, you have the floor. Raphael? So, normally you have the floor. Is it okay for you, Raphael? Normally, Raphael is connected, but we are not here hearing him. So we wait a little bit, Raphael. I don't know. Uh, you can send a message if you have problem in connecting you. So, if it doesn't work for Raphael, we will come back to him uh, after and perhaps giving the floor to Tanya Buzek, European Economic and Social Committee. If it is easier to connect with Tanya. I hear something from Tanya. Yeah. Hopefully you can also see and I hope that the sound connection works well. Good morning, Berlin, and thank you very much for the organizer organizing this very interesting hearing in particular to hear from all the very good presentations that I can also um, use for my own opinion. As Maria has already said, the European Commission, uh, European um, Social and Economic uh, Committee is currently drafting an opinion on sustainable supply chains and decent work in international trade. We are doing so upon the request of the incoming German presidency, and I'm very pleased that Germany is so active um, for this mm -hmm. presidency. Um, just a brief word, like the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly shown the um, high vulnerability of supply chains and the, the high risks that comes with fragmented supply chains. Um, we have seen throughout the processes, I mean, you know very well, we've seen it on the news, we had um, take transport and logistics with seafarers that can leave their vessels while supplying um, the world. We have the TV reports on workers in Singapore, migrant workers in Singapore, not only on the working conditions, but also um, on their living conditions. And just most recently, of course, we have a spotlight on the German meatpacking industry where we just have a cluster of 1,000 workers infected by the mm. coronavirus. So I think this is this has to be a wake-up call. We knew it all along, we had all the reports, but now we have to act. I, as a rapporteur, therefore, I would like to propose a European action plan on human rights, due diligence, and decent work. Um, see it as a comprehensive European framework that needs to be ambitious, comprehensive, and transversal. And what I also would like to do in the opinion to make sure that we can identify the clear roles. It's just what Isabel had said, that workers and trade unions, they are part of the um, solution, they're part of the problem. So in particular, when it comes, what can the European social dialogue and sectoral dialogue, for instance, can do to provide um, businesses to um, comply with new diligence um, rules because the mandatory due diligence should be an important cornerstone of that European action plan. But of course, it will be not one measure that will solve the whole problem. Mm 
it needs to be on the various levels. I mean, of course, the EU level has already been mentioned, but also on the national levels. We do have so many international instruments, take the UN guiding principles, but we also have to have minimum requirements and how to implement them at national levels. And of course, the global arena was already uh, mentioned. And I think the, the important issue is the policy uh, coherence in that um, respect. And as Heidi had said, and I think perhaps just like to um, respond to that um, more promptly is trade will have a very important role in the EU economic recovery. But we all have to understand that this path to recovery has to be a sustainable one. Trade has a large network in place. Uh, we can use that network, but we have to use it more effectively. We have um, a lot of TSD chapters in our agreements and they are evolving over the times, but there is still one big problem. It's their mm. enforcement and also their effective enforceability. You have to make sure also that due diligence, the responsible business conduct is high on the agenda. And as it was also the question how we perhaps can, can link the areas, like for instance, take investment policy. We have so many investment um, treaties. Due diligence should be also seen perhaps as preconditionality in order to enjoy the benefits granted under an investment treaty. And um, the point was also made um, the EU role in like the, the brand that we are enjoying, but also the global leadership role that we can take, not only with the large market of um, consumers, but also with the network that we do have. Um, the EU is currently putting a lot of efforts and ambition in other areas at the multilateral arena. I mean, take the, the efforts for multilateral investment court, for instance. And I myself, I've followed the debates as an observer for the EUC, both in New York and in Vienna. I expect nothing less than this also when it comes to promoting due diligence rule as a standard at the global level. Um, and as we already said, just like trade can be an important role, but also you need to have the links on the various elements. Take public procurement. We already have been advocating for social clauses in public procurement to use that more effectively. There are initiatives, but all of them, they have to be bound um, together. So I think the momentum on the wake up call is, is very high and now is the time and not to argue. It's like to just like focus, for instance, on environment and leave um, based on work um, for a second stage. But perhaps also to have a question for uh, Olivier, one of the biggest challenges, and I think it's the confusion that is between the due diligence process and the legal consequences that companies have to face if they are not in compliance. So any um, any more clear ideas could be very helpful because also for due diligence, I think, and that's what uh, Lara had also said, um, it should become a very normal management instruments for companies to assess the risks of their supply chains. You do it with all the others who try to find the most favorable distribution roads, supply roads, whatever. But you also have to incur, like, you know the supply chains, you have to assess the risks, and then, of course, take proportionate measures in order to not do any harm. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, I will try to give the floor to Rafael. Uh, so, Rafael, you have the floor now. Um, I think that you can be connected. Um, yes. Super. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Sorry, I had to change the device because on the other one it was not working. Uh, Sorry for delay. Can you hear? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, thank you very much for this uh, meeting, if, even if it's virtual, because I think it's really interesting for us. And it's an historical moment. I mean, we all see that there is a window of opportunity, and that's why we have to act quickly and strongly, and uh, because it might, uh, it might change. And we obviously see also that there is a pressure in European public opinion for changes after the COVID crisis or during the COVID crisis, because it's not over. But we might lose the political momentum if we don't proceed very quickly. Uh, and our task in the parliament would be to produce something that's strong enough uh, to influence the commission on that. So the first thing would be to define from the perspective, uh, what is human rights violation? Because uh, of course, for us, it includes social rights, environmental rights, and there is a question of corruption also uh, as a human rights. 
Um, and, and one thing that's very interesting is for us to take into account the, the achievements and the limitations of existing legislation. For instance, in France, which uh, thanks to the Potier, his name was mentioned, uh, is leading in this field, uh, you have a real issue that was uh, underlined by participants on, uh, on, on financial uh, institutions, for instance, because the threshold in terms of employees is so high that you have uh, companies with very, very dark impact on human rights that are escaping from any form of responsibility in the French legislation. So for us, from the Droit perspective, one of the main things, and it was mentioned in the, in the debate, is uh, that a basic human rights is a right to access justice and it's a right to remedy. So one of the main uh, focus we will have is to make sure that you have access to justice and that victims uh, ha have access to justice. And, and the question of burden of proof there is, is, is really uh, fundamental. And um, one thing I, I, I want to uh, question is uh, I heard that uh, everybody is speaking about civil responsibility. Uh, I think it's very important to have penal responsibility too mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for the um, bosses of, of, of multinational companies to be uh, directly penally responsible. At least uh, we will try to push for that because that will also be a game changer if we are speaking about uh, uh, people having power in this world, uh, sharing also responsibility. And, and, and this is a question I want to, uh, to make to the uh, people who spoke before. But thank thank you. you. Thank you, Rafael. I give now the floor to uh, Alejandro Garcia, European Coalition for Corporate Justice. Uh, if it's possible to, 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 to be really short with maximum two minutes uh, in your inter intervention. Alejandro, yeah, you have I, the floor. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay. perfect. Okay, I will be brief. Thank you. Thank you so much, first of all, to Mariana, the, the RBC Working Group, the ITUC and the ITUC for this, for organizing this and, and for allowing us to contribute. I don't want to be repetitive. I don't want to insist on the on the need for the diligence legislation that everyone here uh, seems to agree on. We have been long calling for it at, at EU level, and it's great to see that we are finally um, seeing this growing consensus around it. Uh, not only among us, among civil society and unions, but even more and more among certain businesses that are coming to agree with, with the need for these rules. Um, so due diligence legislation is, is coming, but what we would really like to stress at this point of time is that the way we design these rules now is crucial. The drafting of future uh, due diligence legislation will reshape the way in which our companies engage with their subsidiaries, with their suppliers, with their subcontractors, and will determine the, the debate around business and human rights um, at global scale for the decades to come. Um, but most importantly, it will decide whether victims will have credible means of access to remedy justice or not. And, and they are the reason, the, the main reason why we need these laws, because ensuring a, a, level, a level playing field, uh, which is one of the arguments that we uh, constantly here is, is necessary, it's positive, it's good, but ensuring social and environmental justice in, in our global supply chains is imperative. We, we need justice for victims like, like the Pakistani workers in Karachi that were producing for European retailers and who failed to find redress in German courts after they suffered a factory fire. We need justice for victims like the Chileans in Arica who have developed serious diseases after toxic waste was exported from Europe there and who again failed to, to find redress in Swedish courts. We need justice for victims like the communities in the Niger Delta that have faced uh, serious health risks after oil pollution by European corporations and who have also struggled to find redress in, in European courts. This is why we need not any law, but as Professor De Schutter said before and other speakers, Isabel Rafael, um, made very clear, we need a law with clear liability provisions. We need a law also that tackles the major obstacles to, to access to justice, that tackles the inconsistent rules on applicable legislation, the very short time limits to, to bring legal action, the unfair distribution of the burden of proof. This is, and I shall end here, most of all a matter of justice, but it's also a matter of effective regulation. Only if we have these rules, only if we have real liability attached to it, there will be 
proper due diligence in practice because liability is the true deterrent of abuse. It's the, the true incentive for, for due diligence. So, yeah, but with that, I, I end. Thanks again for this great Thank webinar you. and looking forward oh. to working with you. Thank you, Alejandro. I give the floor now to Francesco Tramonta. Francesco, you have the floor. So, yeah, hi, uh, I work for Mondelez International, it's a large food company. Uh, we are a big business in chocolate uh, globally. Um, we've been one of those companies then in the past few months, I, mean, I would say almost more than one year, we've been quite vocal about the English support of the due diligence legislation. And I won't repeat all the reasons because they've basically all been said. Uh, it's legal certainty. It is about uh, creating a level playing field. But I would say what really is important to understand, I think that's what Tanya has just said. I think for a company that has invested in the supply chain and kind of building the transparency for a long while now, and yet seeing some of the problems still being there, and frankly, some of the problems being beyond our ability to influence our own supply chains, this can provide. Um, a workable framework uh, to evaluate risk and to evaluate remediation. Now, when it comes to go beyond the, the tick the box exercise, it was said before, I think clearly the right level of liability is absolutely important. I mean, this is not just about corporate reporting. Uh, this needs to go beyond it. And that's one point that was clearly said. Uh, the other point which was alluded to is what we call, at least in our sector, a smart policy mix. So due diligence alone will not solve the issue, and we agree it should be at least European horizontal, but we do need for every sector, I think, a set of rules, guidelines that will take a shape that is as different as all the supply chains we operate with to actually help us go and remediate and cooperate. Because as I said before, many of the issues are beyond our direct sphere of influence. We can do a lot, but it's partnership with, in some cases, origin governments, with civil society that will move the needle. Uh, so yeah, that gives you a sense of why we've supported and will be very vocal in our support of the diligence approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Silvia Obregon from the CITSE. You have the floor, Silvia. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Sylvia. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, now, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, to the RBC Group and the ETUC uh, and to Maria Arena for organizing this event, uh, as well as uh, all the other speakers. I'm not going to repeat for the benefit of time, but I'm going to use this moment also to emphasize that we are facing an opportunity to really make a change, a very comprehensive leg legislation that does not only look at uh, human rights due diligence indeed as it has been emphasized but that it can also look at how uh, corporate accountability plays a role in the uh, possibilities of the european union to lead in the sphere of climate action as well because these the issues are not detached from each other so while supporting um, initiatives at the level of the european green deal uh, if we don't look at the at the role of trade uh, and the role of corporate accountability in it, it is going to be impossible to really deliver on the target uh, set in there. As this, at the same time, we want to emphasize that three levels of, uh, are absolutely complementary. At the national level, we have seen member states already putting forward initiatives that have been mentioned here, uh, as well as legislation, but it's absolutely uh, important as well to support the international level and to make an emphasis on this at the binding fit on this human rights, that it's also to protect in a differentiated manner the impacts on women, on human rights defenders, on indigenous communities. And I want to mention these groups and these communities special because that calls for urgency. The EU has been six years um, waiving its responsibility to constructively engage. We're on the sixth round of negotiations 
for the binding treaty and it's time for the European Union to take a leading role in this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. Sylvia, uh, Cathy Roussel, and after the last one will be Paul de Clerc from Friends of the Earth. So, Cathy, you have the floor. Everyone, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this very interesting and timely discussion. So, maybe just a few words about Amphory. So we do represent uh, over 2,400 companies from different sectors in different parts of the world. And we are supporting our members in their journey towards voluntarily uh, advancing human rights due diligence uh, in their supply chain for the past 20 years. So first, let me start by saying that we at Amphari very much support an EU harmonized approach on human rights due diligence, um, because as everyone has been uh, saying, we want a level playing field, um, legal certainty and this is really how we're going to achieve systemic change and uh, it was very interesting because during the the past hour and a half now uh, we we've been discussing on how to take a coherent approach um, to define that framework uh, but to be coherent uh, i think policymakers will also need to be pragmatic to take into account the reality of global supply chain uh, which is why I believe that um, the principle of continuous improvement uh, that is part of the OECD guidelines should be at the heart of the future uh, EU legislation. Because this would support companies' efforts to carry out their due diligence duties, but at the same time also take into account the implementation challenges that may arise on the ground. Um, about the scope, um, all business bear responsibility to respect human rights, this is true, uh, but it's also crucial that steps be commensurate to the capacity, the resources and the leverage of given business and SMEs in particular. This is why uh, I was really happy to hear uh, several times the word inclusive uh, in the, the process that the, the, the Commission needs to take in developing such a framework. So I think the input from civil society organization is needed, but also from the business community as well. Um, maybe one last point. Um, several people have been highlighting the limitations of voluntary schemes. And um, I would like to share with you my conviction that actually voluntary and mandatory instruments advancing the respect of human rights can be mutually reinforcing. So maybe my question would be, um, how do you see in the future that voluntary initiatives and commitment are also promoted and rewarded? Uh, that would be interesting to most. find out. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you, Cathy. And last but not least, Paul de Klerk, Friends of the Earth. Paul, you have the floor. I don't know if you are there. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Maria and Magbule, for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to give you an example from an environmental perspective of what we need European legislation to hold companies accountable for their negative impact. Uh, the example deals with Nigeria. Uh, since the 1960s, exploitation is happening in Nigeria. A number of European companies uh, like Al, Total, any are key players. And six decades of extraction has had devastating impacts on the environment and local people in Nigeria. Thousands of oil spills have polluted the creeks and forests. People's livelihoods from fishing and agriculture have been destroyed. They even lack drinking water. For more than half a century, gas flaring emits their toxic pollution on people in the environment. The Niger Delta has been qualified as one of the most polluted wetlands in the world. In 2011, UNEP, the UN agency, brought out a report about the pollution in Ogonia Land, just a tiny part of the Niger Delta. They wrote how severe the pollution was and how Shell's claims that they cleaned up the oil spills were false. They also proposed a massive program for restoration of Ogoni. 
2029 years later, Amnesty International and Friends of the Earth documented that none of the UNEP identified fill sites has been properly cleaned. In fact, cleanup work has not started in 90% of these places. Due to new oil spills, Ogonia is an even more polluted space than it was nine years ago. Nigerian farmers, fishermen, and local communities have tried to take the oil company to court in Nigeria, but hardly any success. Also, court cases in Europe against other companies take the profits from their subsidiaries in Nigeria have so far not resulted in justice. Shell and Eni continue to argue in court that they are not responsible for their dog company in Nigeria. If we will provide justice in cases like this and stop massive destruction of the environment and protect the livelihood and human rights of local people in Nigeria, we must end the impunity of companies like Shell, Toyota and Eni. We need this new legislation that introduces binding obligations on companies to respect human rights, coupled with civil but also criminal liability. I think it was important what Raphael mentioned. We're not just talking about civil liability from our perspective. We talk about serious crimes. I think the criminal liability option clearly has to be on the table as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, so uh, we have uh, a little bit more than 15 minutes uh, over our time, uh, but I give the floor to Magbule to the question that we received from uh, the participant uh, beyond this webinar. So Magbule, you have the floor now. Um. I think um, I saw that uh, Marcella was able to join us. We're very keen to hear from Marcella from Unilever. So if we could try to give her the floor um, at least for, for, for two minutes, because um, while we want yeah. legislation and that's critical, I think companies already are um, have a duty to carry out human rights due diligence under the OECD guidelines. And um, Unilever has made such commitments. Peter talked about their collaboration. So I, I would very uh, value very much a short input from uh, Marcella if she can connect right now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Marcella, you have so, to go. I was just about to thank you so much, Macaulay, and thank you all of you. I was just writing a message because I couldn't get into before. Um, so just very quickly, as we are finishing, there are two principles. At the core of due diligence is the most important principle that business are run on the foundation of human rights. So for us, it's not just about risk and it's not just about addressing that, which is, of course, part of the process, but it's really about the business strategy and including in all the business models that we run. Peter Rosman, who spoke earlier, and, uh, and we have an ongoing relationship with unions, with uh, IUF, which we, we meet periodically to really tackle the most important issues uh, that, that belong to our business and ITF as, uh, as well mentioned that it's a work in progress and it's true you know all of you everybody have been addressing uh the the uh voluntary um you know approach that has been taken and everybody have been talking about that it doesn't really bring a level playing field it doesn't deliver on the change and the inclusivity in the eradication of the inequality that we want to see so that's basically the principles i wanted to to talk about um, whether we are working with IUF in addressing issues in the agriculture or we're working with ITF talking about migrant workers in the transportation. I mean, it was addressed early on, uh, I, um, uh, I cannot remember the name of the presentation about migrant workers in other places. I mean, these are really very critical issues. And I personally believe that there is a new generation of, of rights and also implementation of rights that are prompted upon us by the new business models and emerging of the gig economy. And last but not least, I think that we need to look at the 360 public procurement. Public procurement is a very important part of this because in many cases it drives much more uh, economic interest that 
every single company. So thank you very much. I have a lot to say, but I know that we are already past on, on the hour. I mean, I'll <laughs> be happy to answer any questions or any further comments. And thank you, Mahuli, for trying to connect me today. <laughs> Thank you, Marcella. Um, I think it's the beginning of our work, so we, 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 we will still be in contact for the future of our work in the European Parliament. And when it comes to the initiative coming from the European Commission and the Council, we will be in contact to perhaps convince some people of our house here that are not convinced that we need to have this legal framework. So we will turn with uh, the companies and trade unions and to, to work with you. Um, so, Magbule, you have the floor. <laughs> uh, we left to answer the many questions that were asked. Uh, what we can promise from our side is that, that we relay some of the Sorry. questions that were specifically addressed to the speakers, to them, so that they can come back to you in written form. I saw in the chat, all of you already did that, but I think we can arrange that for the other speakers. So I think I would just hand it over to um, Isabel for a short closing remarks and thank everybody from my side. Apologize for the technical difficulties, <laughs> but I think we did every, uh, our best to hear from everyone. Um, I would like to, to, uh, to follow up and say thank you for your uh, active involvement in the chat and in the discussions. I think it was, uh, it is much appreciated and uh, we also see that there is a need to act and to act now and that the responsibility lies also with us and with the coordinated action. And I think the coordinated action at the European and international level is key to influence reciprocally the two, uh, the two initiatives uh, and approaches. Uh, coordination at the level of the European Parliament together with the stakeholders. I think it is key to have an ambitious uh, proposal and ambitious uh, reports. And I think this is where uh, I think the the way from the vicious circles that was mentioned at the beginning to the virtuous circle of uh, uh, due diligence uh, and especially when it uh, comes to human rights and uh, responsible business conduct is key. So we need to have a European legislation which is legally binding, which uh, have a very ambitious scope. And I think here uh, the, the different uh, participants have stressed that while having a pragmatic approach, which is also looking at a proportional approach, I would say. We heard that without falling into the loophole of the thresholds, where we see uh, businesses uh, circumventing legislation or escaping legislation. We need to have prevention at the forefront, uh, and I think this is key. And also here, uh, the trading movement at the European level, at the national level, at the international level, uh, are the key actors. And I think here, I think collective bargaining and trade union involvement is key uh, in the businesses, uh, in the company, as well as in the supply chain. And we've heard that the liability dimension, together with the remedies, are key. And I think one of the main uh, issues is, is also here that uh, liability linked to due diligence cannot prevent and cannot delete joint and several liability which are already existing. We need to have also coordination at the European level in terms of the different uh, angles to look at due diligence. We understood that uh, the com commercial dimension, the investment dimension is key. We also looked into the issue of uh, free trade agreements. I think here yeah, the transnational dimension uh, is also very important. Um, not to forget that we are not just speaking about the private, but also the public sector uh, should be involved. So I think here the call for action is, is clear for all of us, and I think we have to join forces to win this battle, I think for the sake of human rights, for the sake of a better society, for the sake of upwards convergence uh, towards human rights, but we have understood also human rights, including the environment, uh, including also uh, the issue of corruption. I think here uh, we have to have such a broad scope. So I would like to very much thank you all of us uh, and thank you all the participants uh, uh, today. And I think it is uh, on that basis that we are looking to uh, be actively involved in the next steps in Europe and uh, at the international level.
thank you thank you all for your participation thank you Magbule, for helping us uh, organizing this uh, webinar uh, thank you etuc thank you ituc thank you all the participants um, and as you have said uh, if we want to achieve something, a very uh, ambitious uh, regular, regulatory framework, we need to work all together. Trade unions, companies, civil society, parliament, commission and council. It is with all of these efforts that we have to have uh, promoting human rights and giving remedies and the capacity for victims to go to justice. We have to work all together. We are at the starting point. This is the work of the European Parliament, and we will meet uh, together for, and ID told us, a lot of different meetings that we will have in the very uh, future here. Uh, thank you for your work, and we still, and we will be in contact for the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Okay.